Hello, welcome everybody. Um, it looks like we are right at six o'clock here. So, um, Doug, can I get a thumbs up on sound? Can you hear me all right? Yeah, it sounds great. Okay, perfect. And I'm screen sharing appropriately? You are. All right, sounds good. Thank you so much. I'm going to keep um, admitting people as, or Doug actually will do that for me as people add in right now. So um, I'm excited to see some um, future Panther parents on here. I'm Sarah Pasillas, and I'm one of the assistant principals here on campus. My alphabet is Q through Z. So if you are on the third night and your child's name is in that last name alphabet, then I am the assistant principal for your student. Um, if you couldn't make it other nights and you're joining us here, then you are welcome. And um, really all of the kids here at Chico High are, are all of the administration's kids. So we are happy to um, support all of our kids all at the same time. So I'm gonna jump right in here. Um, if you guys do have questions, please go ahead and drop them in the chat as we go along. And we will get to those questions um, as we can. So to start out with, um, our, your Chico High administration, principal is Doug Williams, and you have three assistant principals, Brandon Kessler, Erica Sheridan, and myself. And um, we do have the alphabet separated out into thirds, but we do help any kid who walks into our office at any time. So, and we are happy to do so. Uh, just a few general facts for those of you parents who may not have students already at Chico High. Um, our school is approximately um, 1,850 kids. This incoming freshman class is a pretty big group. And so we are excited to have, um, we're excited to have a big group coming in. Um, there's 155 staff members. That includes teachers, um, secretaries, custodial, all the people who make the school run and work are included in that number. So your kids will get to see lots of friendly faces on campus. Um, in order to graduate from high school, from Chico High or from PV or any of the schools in Chico Unified, you do need 235 credits to graduate. A student who is enrolled in six classes for four years is eligible to earn 240 credits. And so there is a little buffer in there, but 235 is the magic number for the high school diploma. Um, next year, there is a proposed start time of 8.30 because of state legislation that has come out. Um, so we're likely going to start that next year. Um, and we will probably only have one lunch. That's a little bit different than has been in the past, but that's going very likely going to be how it's going to be run next year. We do have built-in collaboration time for teachers, which allows there to be continuity of curriculum from class to class so that regardless of who, which class your kids have, which teachers your kids have, they have similarity of curriculum and instruction. Uh, we have over 30 elective offerings here at Chico High. Um, we have four campus supervisors who are out and about on campus checking kids out and they actually, uh, some of them are coaches, um, a lot of them participate in a lot of the other after school activities that go on. So kids do get to know the campus supervisors pretty well over four years. Um, we have 52 security cameras spread between the main campus and the stadium. So we do, um, we do have those in place to keep your kids safe. We have perimeter fencing and locked gates and we have 21 sports teams. So hopefully we have a little bit of something for everybody um, here on campus. And something that's not on here is we also have over 20 different clubs. And so there's, there's a lot of different things for a lot of kids. Um, moving on, our counseling staff, which is uh, the staff members who are going to help your kids pick their classes and get on track. And I'm gonna turn it over to Doug Wyon in just a second. Um, but Ann McMahon is um, the counselor in charge of the top of the alphabet, then Carly Martinez, Amy Baird, Trisha Davey, and Doug Wyon, who is for most of you gonna be the counselor for your kids. Angie Wisdom, she is the counseling assistant and she fields a lot of your phone calls and emails um, and she's happy to help get kids where they need to be. So. With that, um, I am going to turn it over to Doug Wyon, who is our head counselor here at Chico High, 
and he's going to go over kind of the nuts and bolts of the classes that your kids need to take, credits, and so on and so forth. Um, and like I said, if as he's talking, you guys have questions, please feel free to drop something in the chat and I will shoot you an answer back. So thank you so much. And on that note, Doug, it's all yours. Well, thank you. And it's good to see all you out there. I know it's um, maybe something you're getting used to with uh, Zooming and looking into a, uh, an eyeball of a screen and trying to remember that you're really talking to people. But um, it is a little bit awkward still for me. So as we move through this, uh, the goal is, is to help you look at the bigger picture for um, moving through high school. But the majority of our time is really going to focus on your freshman's schedule. So, so as we're moving through this, a lot of the questions you might have, um, you're free to, to um, put those into the chat. Um, but you might want to hold off until maybe we move through the presentation because we might cover a lot of those questions on the front end. We're going to look at a very brief look at graduation and college admissions um, before we sort of dive into the specifics of scheduling for next year. Um, but maybe even to step beyond that, uh, we're starting our, our tour of the middle schools and eighth graders. Um, it started actually this week. We're going to be hitting Bidwell Junior High tomorrow. Uh, we'll be hitting uh, Chico Junior on Monday and Tuesday of next week. And then Wednesday, Thursday, we'll be at Marsh. And um, for students that are in area schools that aren't specifically tied to our district, um, we have an online uh, registration process. And counselors will start calling families uh, that first week of April. And so we're going to go into a little more detail on, show you some sites on our web, uh, web page in a, toward the end of the conversation, but just to know that there is a process. Um, it's a little different this year, um, not what we normally do. Uh, we typically have uh, chances to have you all come on campus and have your students come on campus. And we have a lot of uh, sort of background information going into um, this discussion about registration. So we're sad to think that that hasn't happened for you all, but we'll try to make the most of it um, as we uh, do this through Zoom. Uh, the, the week of um, the first two weeks of April, maybe even the third week, we'll start calling families that have registered online that are in our um, uh, exterior area, if you will. We have families that come from all over the place, actually, um, including private and charter schools and families that come out of our area from Durham and Paradise and so forth. And so we'll be having conversations with them as they move through the registration process. We'll also be meeting with um, students that are on IEPs with our um, school psychologist and uh, resource specialist. And we'll be meeting with those students also in April. So if you're on an IEP, uh, know that you, and many of you probably already know that you'll have a date. And those will generally be Zoom conversations as well. So, so just a quick picture there. And we'll go into more details, like I said, after um, this kind of overview of high school. So with that, uh, Mr. Facias already mentioned, but we do have um, unique requirements to graduate. So that might be new for you. It definitely is a new concept if a student is coming out of middle school and they might be your oldest child. Um, for high school credits, every subject that's required has a specific number of credits. And so if we just use, I'm not gonna go to all these, but if you, we jump into the, the first one there on the list, English. Um, if you look at the, um, the description, we require four years of English and that translates to 40 credits. So practically a student would earn five credits each semester for that one class. Um, and then they would earn 10 credits for the year. And then at the end of the four years, they would have accumulated the 40 credits. You can see we have some very peculiar areas like the second one. We have that one is fine arts, foreign language, or career tech ed. So looking at a scenario, there might be a freshman who takes Spanish one and maybe our um, creative arts class. In the first semester, they'll have five credits from art, five from language, and they will have met that requirement in the first semester. The other credits for the second semester for art and language because they've met the area, would then drop into the elective category. And another kind of unique one is math. You see we break it into two types of maths. It's really so that we can tag the state minimum standard for math, which is integrated math one. But 
technically our requirement is three years of math. So three years or 30 credits. Uh, and so PE sciences help. Um, one thing that might be unique also is that we do have grade specific classes. So if you look at the social studies, history starts uh, in terms of state requirements and our district requirements in the sophomore year. So that's why you see with world history, it shows 10th grade and then US history, 11th government econ senior year. And then again, all kinds of other classes, students might take more science, more PE, or just electives in general, and those will fall into the elective category. Um, so that's sort of a quick overview. We don't expect you to have this memorized or your children for that matter, but it is something that guides us. It's very important that we have students um, stay on track to graduate and that they're meeting credits. Um, Ms. Basias mentioned this already, but you see the bottom line is 235 that's a five credit buffer for, for a student who finishes four years of high school. What that means practically, if a student fails one semester, they're now on the bubble for graduation. If they were to fail two semester classes, now they're in the negative. And we have ways of making that up through credit recovery and summer school, but it really just presses the point that we wanna make sure students have a really good start to their freshman year so they don't really put themselves in harm's way of losing credit and therefore maybe having to scramble to make up those credits for graduation. Every year counts, um, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior year toward those graduate accumulated credits. So I'm gonna stop there and flip into um, college admissions just briefly. Uh, this is a standard that is uh, statewide, so it's unique to California, although a lot of other states follow a very similar pattern. And you may have heard it called um, the college prep pattern or A through G. You'll see that it's an alphabetical listing. Ironically, they're not in alphabetical order, uh, but there are just a listing of classes that are specifically required for college admission. And when we say college, we're gonna narrow that down because it's a broad title to Cal States and the Universities of California. And so if we, we plow through those just again, very quickly, uh, the first one is U.S. History, World History, which we mentioned is actually a state standard anyway, uh, two years. Because we also require government econ, the G, college prep elective, is also covered. English, four years of English, is exactly what high school requires as well. And visual performing arts, even though it's part of our requirements, uh, it's a very unique and specific class for college. Uh, they actually have deemed some of our, and actually most of our art classes and music classes, and even some of our career tech ed classes as visual performing art, and that's a one-year requirement. Well, I always call that the bread of the college admissions plan because that's our, those are items that frankly are pretty easily met, and actually most of our students meet that, but when you get to the meet in the middle, it gets a little more complicated. Look at the math, for example. IM1 was the minimum to graduate from high school, but for college admissions, it's IM1, 2, and 3, so those three years, that's quite a journey through the math sequence. For science, it's not just any science, it has to be a lab science. So typically lab biology, lab chemistry, or ag biology, ag chemistry, or students could take physics instead of chemistry. And then they also need two years of language, which we said you could use language or art or career tech ed in high school. College has a specific two years of foreign language requirement. So those kind of play out into a student's schedule as they move through the four years, um, that ends up being 15 academic areas. If you were to take the art off of that, just kind of a side note, for NCAA, students who wanna play college sports, if you took the art off, you would have 14 academic areas in the A through G, and NCAA quite, requires 16 areas. So you'd have to add two additional areas of college prep elective, and those can be specific and unique to D1 students versus D2 or D3. So another thing that we could discuss with students if that's an area that they wanna plan for. Um, I'm gonna switch over to my screen here. So I'm gonna switch and, and try to share my screen. This will be technologically advanced work for me. So let's see if I can pull this off. There we go. Oh my Lord, I think I did it. Okay, and share, look at this. Okay, um, and I'm gonna switch my, camera over here so that I can actually look at my screen that I'm looking at here. There we go. So um, we're going to do a 10 cent tour of college. And so I'm going to show you college admissions. Uh, this little comic is just a, um, a screen filler. 
but I do think it's kind of a funny one because I think a lot of um, a lot of times as parents, I know I was as a parent with my children going to high school, I think I was a little more anxious about that experience than my kids were. And so this is just kind of a funny on that, having um, kids kind of comment about making sure that they kind of put up with their parents, if you will. Um, as we move forward though, just again, this is to maybe help you have a definition of what I mean by college and how varied they can be. So we're gonna sort of put aside other trainings because there's lots of opportunities to train that are not college. There are places like tech schools. Uh, the military has great training. There's all kinds of opportunities through even locally with adult ROP. But we're gonna focus specifically on sort of the college systems. California Community College is one of them. What's unique about them beyond the fact that they do all kinds of vocational work and the first two years of college is that there's no admission criteria. So all that X's and O's about A through G doesn't technically apply to the community college, even though we like to have students who plan on moving toward a bachelor's to really prepare as much as they can with the A through G so that they feel like they're ready to start the, the, uh, the four-year journey through a bachelor's degree. There's over a hundred community colleges, which is mind-blowing. California is rich in, in universities and college opportunities. California State University, our local Chico State is part of that. You can see there's a good handful of those students, uh, of those colleges, there's around 20. Um, and so there's a really nice variety of these colleges. Most of the Cal States follow A through G. Yeah, well, I should say follow use it as their admissions process. And there are a few of these schools, many of them actually, a good handful, that have even more rigorous requirements than just A through G. And so that's something to, to think about where uh, they become a system that if you meet A through G, you have C's or better in all your classes, uh, there's, a, there's a good chance that you'll find a Cal State that will admit you. Um, Universities of California or UC campuses uh, our most local is Davis. You probably have heard of campuses like Berkeley and UCLA and others. These are more competitive campuses. Competition doesn't always mean better. It just means that more students want to go there than they have room available. And that competition really comes down to the quality of a student's schedule. Students who take more rigor or more classes, academic classes, have a better chance of getting into schools in the UC system. And not to... Um, persuade you one way or the other, or maybe dissuade you from doing a UC campus. But if we look at a, just a couple examples, two of the harder campuses to get into would be UC Berkeley and UCLA. If you did the most rigorous schedule Chico High offers, you had the best grades you could possibly get, all A's, and you had really outstanding SAT scores, assuming SATs are still around in the next four years, they may not be, um, you would have approximately a 50% chance of getting into a Berkeley or UCLA. So perfect students have done everything they could possibly take in high school with perfect grades. You're flipping a coin to get into a campus like Berkeley or UCLA. Now we have kids go there. So I'm not saying your students shouldn't be encouraged to keep moving forward in that goal, but it just goes to show you how rigorous some campuses can be in admission. Um, one last category is sort of an eclectic group because it's um, all of the California private colleges. You can see there's a, a good number of, I think about 80 there and that doesn't even include all of them, it's just the ones that are part of this um, consortium. Uh, these campuses will vary almost as broadly as the systems within the California public system. Some are like the community college where admissions is just, you show up, you sign up and you're in. There aren't many of those. Uh, there's, a, there's definitely those that are more like Cal State. Any student wanting to come with certain criteria and certain prerequisites can get in. And then there's others that are equally, if not more rigorous than the UC system. So my goal in all of this 10 cent tour of college wasn't to give you much more than an informational background so that you can kind of get a sense of the types of opportunities. And like I said, California is rich in opportunities for students and, and other states are as well. So I shouldn't just be pro California, but there's just lots of great opportunities for students as they move past the high school years and our goal for students ultimately is that we're able to plan according to their will and that they are able to work at the level needed to get to that point. Um, I'm gonna just give you a quick look again at the A through G requirements. 
Again, it's uh, the histories, English, math, science, foreign language, which are kind of the five core academic areas, and then the visual performing arts. And like I mentioned already, the college prep elective kind of takes care of itself. It also becomes a catch-all for many, many, many areas. I mean, for example, our welding counts as a college prep elective. Um, so it's, there's a lot of different classes that fit into that category. Let me flip over here. If I was to um, get off of the X's and O's for a minute here, <laughs> because I know it gets confusing, let me just first state that our, our goal and our job is to help you and your child move through this process according to their goals and to help them not only graduate, but have as many opportunities leaving high school. But I think you would probably agree with me that if, if, if you were talking to your son or daughter moving out of spring break, and at, we're talking to them about what they were most excited about in returning to school, it probably wasn't the next chapter in history. It's probably this type of thing. It's about students finding their niche, if you will. They like to be with peers. They want to express themselves in all kinds of activities and with their special talents. And I think you'll find that Chico High also is quite rich. Um, we are very fortunate in Chico to have two amazing high schools with so many opportunities for students to be involved in things that will give them skills that frankly blow us away. When we hear um, performances or we see artwork or we look at what can happen in a welding or an architecture or a floral design or a computer science class, uh, or our home, or, or um, our health careers classes, and I probably have offended a lot of our teachers. That I probably forgot a few. Um, it's amazing, frankly. It's amazing what our students can do, and that's our goal for your child: is that they can find a place at Chico High through our clubs and our sports and our curriculums that they can really feel connected and make friends that have common interest and um, really have the fond memories that most uh, do leaving high school. So. X's and O's aside, this is really a priority goal for us as your child comes into Chico High School. Um, now we're going to dive into the nitty gritty. So what is my student's schedule going to look like for next year? And so I'm going to start by just showing you some, um, some quicks, if you will. Uh, these are the three that everyone will take. Everyone will take an English, a math, and a PE. And then there's going to be three other courses, oops, let me back up, three other courses that will be unique to your student. And we'll talk about what those might be as well in just a minute. Um, a lot of the common questions that come up are things like, I'm scrolling too fast, um, English options. And um, primarily, it falls in the line of honors English or regular college prep English for most, most students. And my quick on that is simply to say, we want to know your student's preference. There will be some district um, gleaning, if you will, but I want to know, for example, our district's process may say, your child is ready for honors. And you may say, that's nice, but no thank you. I only know that if you tell me. So we want to make sure as we register students, we know your preference on the front end. My quick look at honors English would be simply, Students that are good readers, even maybe dare say avid readers, are the types of students that generally enjoy honors English because they do more novels typically than a typical college prep English. And students who write a good essay, you can make sense of it. It's got a good topic sentence. It makes the points that are needed. Um, you know, it's nice if they can move through some type of expression. That's another usually key factor for a student moving into honors English doesn't mean to be that they're perfect in those things. Um, and then obviously willing to put up with the homework and extra um, responsibilities in that class. One thing I'll say also as a disclaimer is that it's not uncommon for a student to not be in honors English. I'll repeat that, not be in honors English freshman or sophomore year and still choose to take AP English. And there's kids that move in and out of honors English and in and out of AP English. So it's not a track by any means. So don't overstress about honors or not honors, especially in the freshman year. We're going to talk a little bit, oops, I keep going the wrong direction, sorry. <laughs> We're going to talk a little bit about math levels in just a minute and sequences. We're definitely going to talk a little more in detail about should I take biology. It's a big, it's a big question. Biology and foreign language are probably the biggest decisions in the freshman year because they require a lot of focus and self-initiative 
a lot of memorizing and studying for tests and probably more than they've ever had before. And so that's a major step up. And I, I, I kind of, in my brain say, that's where a student kind of cuts their teeth on what it looks like to be a student um, because it's not something they may have done before, at least at that level and that type of rigor. And they're doing that along typically with math and English. What about help? Um, help is very common for the freshman year, although we do have students delay on taking help. Uh, I even have a few seniors, I shouldn't admit that, but I do have a few seniors that are still in help or taking help for the first time. And um, we do also have an online help. So there's different ways to do help. And band, yes, band does count for PE. So you may have heard that and it does. There's a way to get, um, uh, students can do marching band as part of their concert band, and that allows them to um, do uh, and, and, and earn the PE credits. So math for next year is a big one. I would lean on a very um, solid recommendation that you allow your student to consult with their math teacher, um, their current math teacher for that. Uh, there are two often types of students, some students that are really very good students, they study, they prepare, but they really have a hard time in the concepts of math. That might be a student that repeats it. It's a good year, frankly, to repeat a class. Um, our math C, if you look at the sequence, is often called math eight at some of the middle schools, and then it moves into integrated math one, two, three. It's possible your child is in integrated math one right now. Some might be in integrated math two even, so we see lots of different levels coming into math. The thing about math to remember though, is every year gets harder. And if we're not doing well this year, we don't want to jump into more rigor if we're not ready for it. And so having that chance to repeat, some kids, here's the other extreme, are getting a C, they do really well on their test, but they just don't do their homework. They need to start doing their homework because if they don't, they are not going to be able to be successful in the continuing sequence of math. It becomes the tortoise and the hare scenario. The student who's learned to study and struggles often does better than the student that everything just comes easy to them and they have never had to really learn the disciplines of studying and doing homework and being consistent. After I am three or integrated math three, we move, not every student does this, but the sequence would move into pre-calculus and calculus or some students um, deviate into AP statistics AP is a title that stands for advanced placement, and it means it's college curriculum offered at the high school. And we also have a class called advanced math. So we have lots of different choices after the integrated math three option. I'm gonna move into a, just a little discussion, uh, and I call it a story of three schedules. And I don't want to be presumptuous because it might seem like I'm trying to shove a very broad spectrum of student achievements into three narrow categories, and I am, so forgive me for that. Uh, but just as I broad brush these areas, just try to see how your child might fit into them. Um, the first is, I'm sorry, I keep scrolling the wrong way. Maybe I'll hit my button there. Nope, that doesn't work either. There we go. The first is, uh, I'm ready to take on the world. This is a student who's advanced, uh, I think I have one of those in my own family, my, my, my oldest son. I shouldn't say that because he will probably um, tease his other children or my other kids. But um, that is the kid who packs their own lunch. They tell you when their doctor's appointments are. They do their homework. You don't even hardly know they're in school, but they're still doing great. Um, they're just rare, but they just seem to get it easily. And that's a bummer if that's your oldest child and your others aren't like that. But I will just tell you, they're unusual. That can happen, but it's unusual. And if you have more than one child like that, good for you, because most of us don't. Um, this is a second type of person who really wants to go to college. They are really hardworking. But you might be a little concerned that high school might blow them away a little bit. Maybe they need a lot of help, even though they're working hard. They get good grades, but there's a lot of effort put into it. And the last category would be a student who Frankly, you're just hoping they have a great high school start. They've had a difficult year and we all have, but just generally speaking, school is not their thing. So we're gonna look at these types of schedules so you can kind of get a sense of how your student might fit into this planning for next year. So let's start with the advanced student. 
Um, of course, they will take three of the typical everyone takes classes. English could be honors, doesn't have to be. Math, it could actually be Math C, but I just put Math 1 and 2 there. It seems to be the more typical. And then PE, which is required. Biology, I would say absolutely. They would def definitely, if they're that BA student, um, they are definitely the type that would take biology. And then our foreign language options would be Spanish or French. And some kids actually are in Spanish this year. And it kind of goes along the lines of the math conversation about ready for the next level or maybe repeating. But I would say definitely Spanish one uh, or French one would be a great choice. And the last class is, I call it their happy class, whatever makes them happy. I would love for your students to either explore one of our CTE pathways or pursue some passion here on Chico High's campus. And I think there would be a lot of opportunities to do that. It could be anything from yearbook to student government to welding, floral design, it could be anything. I often get the question though, that's cool, but is there anything I could get out of the way or I don't have a passion or a pathway interest? A lot of students put help there and they put the help class and careers, it's combo semester of each, uh, or they get their visual performing arts class done. They take a VP art just to get the college VP art done. So there's lots of different options there. Um, looking at this hardworking student, of course, they'll have that happy class as well. Everyone does. Um, they'll have their three core, English, again, maybe honors if it's their thing. Um, math C or Math 1 is pretty typical. PE for sure. Biology is the decision zone. I think for the really focused student who can you know, read decently and, and get through a textbook, is willing to put in the work to memorize um, concepts in biology, I think that would be a good choice. Um, and then the foreign language is definitely an option as well. Uh, but I could say biology could be the one that might be the biggest decision zone there. And we could beg into maybe health or um, some other elective, okay? Um, and so let's look at the last student. Um, man, I am really going the wrong direction here. Uh, there we go. For the student whose school is difficult for them, um, English, again, is given. Math C or Math 1, they could be in Math 2, who knows? I mean, it really depends on their, their abilities there. Um, PE, for sure. I keep blinking the wrong way. I'm sorry, I'm going the wrong direction. It feels like I'm going, there we go. Keeps slipping on me. I, I do my, I'm doing it with my mouse and it keeps rolling the wrong direction. Um, intro to science, I think, would be appropriate. Uh, I think it's really a good idea to start science uh, in the freshman year. Definitely a happy class with a career a tech ed path or, or something that can allow them to pursue a passion. And it really is common for a lot of kids to get help out of the way in the freshman year. So this is not a bad way to go. I would argue, though, that if, if you're thinking, you know, I don't know if I want them to even be in science. I think the English and math and health is enough. That's okay. Have them do, if they're into music, have them do a choir and, and a piano class. Or if they're into art, have them do, you know, one of our, a couple of our art classes or a couple of career tech ed classes. So there's lots of choices there. So I don't want to say that that's uh, predictive and it's not the end of the world. You only need two years of science. You've got four years to do it. We really want this student to have the best start possible in high school. Um, when we look at balancing, this is kind of what's in the back of my brain as we talk about when to take what and how to choose classes. When we compare this balancing concept with what your student has done probably for the last three years, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, if you look on the left there, eighth grade schedule, every student has been in English, math, history, and science for the last three years, and some of them even in Spanish. So they might have been in five academics and a PE, but typically it's PE and an elective. If you look at the ninth grade schedule for a typical student, English, math, if we were in science and foreign language, it's still four academics. Now they're a little harder, and if it's biology, it's a lot harder, um, but it still is within the wheelhouse of a lot of students. But back to the premise, if you said, yeah, they've been in four and they've really struggled with four, we don't want them in four. We, let's start them with three or less even. Uh, and then PE and elective becomes the, the, um, the next ones, if you are the other classes you put in there. If you look at balancing the academic load, again, between maybe the freshman and sophomore year, 
this is where biology becomes a big decision zone. Because if we took biology in the freshman year, and I would say if you're leaning toward that, this is why maybe I would encourage you to do biology in the freshman year. Because if they're gonna be in IM1 or Math C in the sophomore year, they're gonna come up to a harder math class. And they'll also move from Spanish one or French one into Spanish two. And if you said, well, let's just wait till the sophomore year to start sciences. Well, world history is sneaking in there as well. Now we're at five academics and that could be a lot. So I would kind of lean toward having a student who might be on the bubble, cut their teeth with a four academic freshman year, if it's appropriate, um, versus waiting on a science, especially biology. Um, now for a student who's like, that's cool, college, I'm not, he keeps talking about college, it's really not my thing. Then the science, if it's an introductory science, really could go either year. And I think still the science in the ninth grade year makes sense because it frees up that extra elective. If you look at the bottom class, students have that extra elective, which I think is really important for them in that, um, that sophomore year. And there are some students in the sophomore year who take chemistry. If you were to walk into any of our chemistry classes for the last 10 years, half of them are juniors who waited a year because five academics was gonna be overwhelming in the sophomore year. And the other half are sophomores who chose to step up into five academics, which is another big hit for them in the sophomore year. So those are the kind of balances that we look for in counseling to make sure that we're keeping students reasonably um, scheduled so that we don't overwhelm them. And every year, including this year as an eighth grader, helps predict the next year as we look at the ninth grade year. Um, I would say, and I'm gonna step off of that for a minute and we'll have questions in a second, but this, this is really, um, if, if I wanted to just talk parent to parent with you, staying connected and involved with your child is paramount in the high school years, equally in the ninth grade years. Uh, it's a big transition in ninth grade for students. They're coming out of middle school. Um, the system's gonna change on them. I've heard some theorists say that the, the um, adolescent years, which you're in those now with, with um, moving through uh, the junior high middle school years, but definitely as you move into the high school years, it's as much work in the parenting as the toddler years were. And you probably can attest to that because it's, it's a lot of things to keep um, on, on top of and balanced. So I would encourage you to definitely keep connecting with your kids, um, keep connecting. If you don't think something sounds right, call that parent who they were going to visit. Um, definitely check in with them, check in with us. You can always uh, check on Aries to see how they're doing in school. You can contact teachers or counselors or admin. Uh, we we um, want to partner with you to make sure really ultimately at the end of the four years here at high school, your child has grown uh, in all ways. I know they'll grow physically. That's kind of a given. We want them to grow emotionally, uh, really in all ways, uh, academically, um, socially, and that growth is a partnership. So, And we want them really, bottom line, is to have a ton of options as they leave high school so they can go out and do those things that they've set their hearts to and that their dreams and wishes really do have the opportunity to come through. And, and I think high school, it's incredible when I look out beyond these incoming eighth graders and see them exiting as seniors, it, it's incredible what many of them develop into. Some still have some rough edges like we all still do, but some of them are just absolutely ready to take on the world. So it's really exciting for us um, as we, as we let's see this happen as educators. So I'm gonna, Sarah, bounce it back to you because you've been monitoring the chat room and then there might be some specific questions for us. Actually, Doug, there is just one that popped up um, and it's very timely. Um, just a question about, will the students receive the same college and class requirement presentation? And that is what you've been, that's the plan in the, in the uh, going to the junior highs, but you can elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, thank you. And I would say in, in most years, here at, here at Chico High, we were fortunate to sort of jump ahead of the process. We sort of asked um, forgiveness instead of permission. And so we did our traditional classroom visits where we do a lot of this type of thing. We try to push curriculum 
out to students that really um, address the commonly asked questions, whether they know they should ask them or not. Um, our eighth grade visits have been limited to just a one day visit. So um, unfortunately, what we're trying to do in the one day is a little more than we probably should be doing. But we're really honing in on choosing classes and the ramifications of those choices, if you will. Um, and specifically looking at the language and biology, because that is really the big decision zone, especially for that college bound student. And then with the English, again, we want to know the student's preference. Um, because if they didn't want honors and our district said they should want it, we want to know that. And if they're disappointed by not getting an honors because they did want it, we want to be able to see maybe if we could advocate for that student. So um, there's just a lot of pieces that are there that we need to have in front of us. Um, so unfortunately, I, I don't shouldn't say that because I don't want to disappoint you, but it's not going to be as robust as we would like. Um, we have recorded this actually. So if you want your student to listen to this, I think it would be appropriate. And um, we can, um, I don't think I gave away too many parenting secrets. Um, and so the, uh, the element of being able to be at the junior highs and get them sort of moving into schedules. I will say one thing that we've been communicating as we've already started this process with students. Um, we do realize that you're, I, I told kids in one class, it's like I gave you a gift card for 60 bucks to chase into Target and buy $60 worth of stuff. Most people haven't thought about that. They just have a card and they got to come out of the store with items. We do have a return policy. So if, if, if in the end we didn't um, mail it or you have questions as a parent, um, you'll actually be able to see on the most part their schedules if you're in an Aries account now. Um, uh, you can toggle and uh, actually move to the Chico High element of that. Um, there should be, um, I know it'll be on the student's account at least. And then we're going to also st send students home with their chosen schedule. And a quick email to us can make that adjustment. Uh, if you're out in the distant learning land or you're out of the district in general, um, feel free. Uh, we're going to share some things off our website here in just a minute, but feel free to email us questions or propose schedules and we can give feedback. We're asking um, families that are out of our district as you process registration that we have a, a, at least the latest grade report. It helps us a lot to know um, you know, what the student may have had successes or struggles in this last year. And if there's a, a cumulative grades that have complicated or compounded over the, the sixth, seventh and eighth grade, that would be helpful too. Uh, we don't always get all of those, but it's nice to have more of a transcript, if you will, of the sixth, seventh and eighth grade. But even just this last semester's eighth grade would be helpful. Sarah, if you could pull up our website, I'm gonna show families a couple things. Perfect, go ahead and stop screen sharing, Doug. Oh, I'm sorry. How do I do that? Oh, I see that. Yep. Thank you. There we go. Um, I will pull up our website. Um, there is one other question. There's a couple other questions, but one of them kind of applies to what you're talking about. Um, dual enrollment of can a student take foreign language at Butte College and can that count, but also other classes like are there replacement classes at View College or Chico State that, that would be appropriate. And so. Yeah, that's a really good question. And, it, and it's something, uh, yeah, that comes up a lot. Uh, there's some really odd ed codes, if not that it's good reading, but if you read through the ed code, there's a lot of contradictory codes. But one of them that's kind of got me befuddled a little bit is that there's a limit on how many credits a student can take and then use toward graduation. And so college credits have a limit on as they come to high school, and this is another formula you may not want to know, but three credits of college equals about 10 credits of high school. And they'll only allow 40 total credits of accumulation from junior college or college classes to count toward high school. I don't know why that rule exists. The other rule makes more sense to me, and that is you have to be enrolled for X number of hours in a high school to be a full-time high school student. And in our case, that's four periods. But then they limit how many credits you can take as a college student um, to 11. So you're a part-time college student. 11 is nuts. I would not recommend that. Um, but then four periods here become a minimum high school student. And if you fold it over on itself, you can't be a concurrently enrolled student at Butte unless you're fully enrolled at a high school. And so that's where those two kind of blend together a little bit. 
but there are opportunities to do that. I'm not a big fan of math acceleration. I haven't found it be the success for most students, um, but it is an option. I've had some success um, stories, but I'd say more not success stories. Um, and I think, frankly, students probably need a summer to just take a breath. Um, so I hope I answered that correctly. Sometimes I ramble, sorry. Um, on our website, uh, if you go under, you can just Google can Chico it? High. Is it, is it up there, Doug? It is. Okay. If you go under counseling and drop down to registration, you can see we have um, linked all of our materials that went out at every grade level. And you're welcome to look at all of them. But in particular, if you scroll down, there is the incoming eighth grade um, packets that we will be taking out to the schools. And you do not have to print these because we'll be passing them out to students. However, if you are gonna be more um, a, I'm not sure, we'll, go, we'll call it a phone call, Zoom registration process, uh, these would be very helpful to go over with your student. And so the first page is simply, we'll just kind of scroll through this, but the first page is um, all of our names and, and our links and such. Um, you'll see, um, it's kind of our talking points, if you will, in our conversation with students. The next page is really just encouraging students to be involved in school. And we talk about clubs and uh, volunteerism and the different seasons of sports, if you will. Uh, one plug on sports, there are definitely athletic teams that your student can just show up and they're on the team. There's other teams that are quite competitive to get onto. So sometimes we encourage students around those lines. Um, the next little phase is just about success. I would say that's a really helpful ABCs of success. I feel like those are good check-ins. And often the encouragement is, if these are areas you are struggling with, you need, you've got about 10 weeks to figure that out before you get to high school. So use the next 10 weeks of middle school to sort of get these home, things like attending regularly or being focused in class behaviors and committing to doing homework and learning how to study and how your brain brings in and pulls out information. If you keep plowing through, um, this is the, uh, the, uh, the high school and, and college admissions. There's some maps that are very similar to what we looked at already with UC Cal States, just kind of distinguishing. This is probably a very helpful page. It shows all of our CTE pathways and all of our electives. And so it really gives students the sequences of all those programs with the class you typically start with, the classes that they build toward, our CTE pathways are based on the California state standards, and they all have completion slash certificates connected to them. Some of them are articulated with View College as well. Uh, and then if you move to the next page, this next page needs a, a, a tremendous disclaimer because this is a sample, 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 sample schedules. They are not realistic for many students. But the first one is the, how can I get through high school and I don't really care about anything else but taking fun classes and getting out of high school. So that is the diploma track, if you will, and the minimum requirements for high school. We place things in there. Some of them are random, some of them are when you have to take them. The next one is the Cal State, and it's basically asking the question, how can I spread out academics as far as possible and still meet the Cal State standards? So distinct on that might be that you'll see that the, the biology and chemistry are in the junior senior year, or you could flip it with language. But that's a typical giving your math a chance to ramp up. So you have maybe the skills for biology chemistry. I don't think I've ever had someone do that schedule in that order, but it's just kind of giving that extreme. And the very last schedule is I want to do maximum. And that is maximum. That would be a very, very rigorous schedule with AP or again with that title advanced placement or college level curriculum offered, and I think even in the sophomore year, that schedule is very similar to what you would take as a freshman in college. So it becomes a very rigorous schedule. And having said that, they weren't my friends in high school. I only knew a few of them by name maybe, but there are kids that do that here. It's amazing how many kids actually can do that. But my concern is always when I publish something like that, that a student who shouldn't be doing that strives to do that and they end up really becoming disillusioned with their abilities. That is not our goal at all. So don't um, 
pressure students beyond the needed kick in the pants, if you will, to do more than they should. I always analogize it with going into the weight room and throwing on a bunch of weight that you should not be lifting and you have two spotters and as you lift it, you have someone take a picture very quickly because there's nothing gonna happen but trouble with that much weight. You really need to take off the weight so you can get a good workout on the bench press or whatever. And I just, I'm always concerned that sometimes students over schedule and we see that in their emotional health. We see that in their academic success, their GPAs plummet. And as I say that, some of you have students that will make that look easy, which is always amazing to me. So I don't want to assume that that's not a schedule a student wouldn't take from one of our listeners, but I do want you to be cautioned that don't, don't have your students over schedule um, and get overstressed and um, end up really in, in a worse scenario. So that's the packet. Uh, maybe one other thing on the website, if you don't mind, Ms. Pasillas, if we go um, back to our website, for those of you that are out of our area, if you see right, the, the third item is enroll, the third tab. So um, you see that one? There we go. If you hit, did you miss? <laughs> oh, you're there. I'm sorry. You're fast. Um, there, this is where you start enrollment. So if you haven't enrolled your child in our district, um, this is where you start. We've linked some of our registration materials there, but frankly, most of them are under counseling and registration. It's just a little quick tab for some of our, we have a predominant number of students that are coming in are freshmen. So we wanted to tab those to make it a little more convenient. Um, but that, that's the beginning point. And once you're in our system, our registrar will start making um, conversation with you so that we have all the data. Once we have all the data, we'll start making phone calls out to families um, about the time we come back from our junior high spin. And so that'll be sometime in that early to mid April. I can ramble on forever. Sorry about that. You guys have been way patient. Um, I just want to chime in a couple other things about the website. Um, there is a lot of information here on the front page. We do have scrolling announcements. And so events that are coming up or just general athletic updates. So we, we do have a great bit of information here. Um, activities, if your student is interested in what clubs do we have to offer? What does CSF look like? There is a list of the clubs here um, that your student can look through and see is there anything interesting to them? Because I think sometimes um, at the onset, it feels like you know high school is all about just focusing on advanced academics or just focusing on sports. And there really are so many more opportunities here on campus. Um, and, and the website does have a lot of information about all of those. So that's under the activity, activities tab. We do have the athletic tab where you can go and see the sports that um, kids are, might maybe might be interested in. And then there's departments. Um, you can check out uh, different departments and see what there is, um, what the offerings are. A lot of departments do have videos up so you can uh, go through and see what departments have to offer. Um, and then there's a, there's a few other tabs. But if your child has questions about what does Chico High have to offer, how can I get involved, I highly recommend heading to, um, heading to the website to kind of see what there is to offer. So I do want to pop back to here. Um, if you guys do have questions, please drop them in the chat box. There have been a couple of questions about possible tours, like the tiers change, if COVID changes. Um, the answer is absolutely. If we get the go ahead to have groups of kids on campus walking through campus, our intention is to get as many kids here to familiarize them. Our tentative plan is um, a program called Link Crew, which is actually at the end of the summer. Um, right before school starts. Kids are partnered up, incoming freshmen are partnered up with um, Associated Student Body uh, leadership kids and they take a tour, they have their schedules, they walk around, they see where their classes are. And so we are hopeful that if those types of events cannot happen in this spring, um, because usually we do have an eighth grade visitation day that we weren't able to do this year, um, but we are definitely planning tentatively on, on still maintaining 
link crew, because that is a really important thing for incoming freshmen to feel connected. Even if they have older siblings here, for a lot of kids, it's that first step on the big campus and we just want them to feel comfortable and supported so that that is in the works. Um, Doug, there's still a couple of questions about registration and whether or not, like how many other schools, um, are you planning on going to Notre Dame? Are you planning on going to, I think you already went to Chico Country Day, um, but what are, who are the schools who you will, who you will specifically visit and which schools would have to reach out because we don't have visits scheduled? Yeah, I think um, Chico Country Day is a good example. We went there um, this week and even with that, there are students that were absent. And so the district has sort of, um, and I shouldn't blame on the district, but I think, and I start, don't wanna to try to make, sound like I'm blaming on the district, but we're limited to just one visit. And we've really targeted schools that we have usually 30 or more students coming our way. And so um, we have uh, a Bidwell visit. I think we have 40 some kids coming from Bidwell. We'll be there tomorrow. And then we have, well, hundreds from Chico Junior and Marsh. And that'll be next week on Monday, Tuesday, Chico Junior. And Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm sorry, Wednesday, Thursday uh, will be Marsh. And then other families, that, which will be a lot, we'll have kids that are on distant learning at all the schools just mentioned and students who've missed our visit. Um, we're going to be um, using email. Uh, we'll be connecting with families uh, by phone, probably most, and Zoom, and then working through registration. Uh, we'll have probably just over 500 students. Um, it's kind of an interesting, not to put you into my world, but we, we bring on a, a group of 500 kids, but we're also dealing with our 1,800 kids. So it's kind of like we've added to our school but we didn't add personnel. So it becomes a little bit unique, if that makes sense. Um, so, so having said that, we, we wanna make sure that ultimately we're helping families really make good decisions. It, it, in some ways, it really comes down to some of those tenets that we talked about in decisions between biology or not, honor teams or not, those types of things. Um, and then the other thing I mentioned to the other groups and a question came up, that there may be someone in, in this group uh, that's actually enjoying online. It's working for you as a family and you might be a distant learner family. We do have, and PBA does as well, we have online academies. We call it the Panther Online Academy. Uh, PV has a, the, the Viking Online Academy, real catchy titles, but it uses the Edgenuity curriculum. And, uh, but having said that, it, it actually gives the student the full benefits of being a Chico High student. We have students that take our curriculum with that. Sometimes they'll be, uh, again, four, full time is four, so they'll be like four online, and they can choose to take two classes here on campus. So we've had kids in the Panther Academy that have taken band or art or welding or you name it, or science or math, um, along with their uh, classes online and come for those periods. Um, and then they also can participate in anything, clubs, sports, anything else we do. So, um, and so it sort of parallels, actually, we were the beginning of online if those two academies, both the Chico and PV, and then the Oak Bridge is its own entity, if you will. It's its own school, but we often have a pretty full slate of students, which that doesn't mean anything if I throw, throw a number out. So probably about 20 students um, doing our online academy in a given year. I recommend though, if, if, if COVID isn't the concern, that students get the most benefit for being in person. I think that connecting with other students and um, connecting with um, the, the, the elements of high school, uh, I think is the, the, the best benefit, but there's all kinds of reasons that students aren't able to do that. And I'm really uh, very, um, I think it's really positive that our district has provided an opportunity for students who can't um, come in person. So. I think that's something to consider. If that's you, um, we actually would like to know that along with the courses that you're interested in because we do have some paperwork involved in getting that set up. So we'd have to have you fill out our, um, because it's an alternative option, we're considered a comprehensive high school. You walk here, you're in. But alternative options, you need more of an application process that allows us to document that it's a choice to do that. So we have some paperwork for that, but it's very simple and we can get that going. 
All right, I, I think we're getting through most of the questions here in the chat. Um, Doug, I don't, I, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm not entirely sure. So I'm gonna ask the question and see if, a, if as far as immunization records are concerned, mm -hmm. For students who are in good standing in the district and the district already has the immunization records, we don't need additional copies of that. But if they're coming in from outside of the district, yes. then then they do, then they need that. Yeah, and it's, um, you know, the, the rules change quickly on me. And the rule of thumb, though, is generally if you're in a California high school now or middle school now, the immunizations will be the same. So we just need to get documentation and what happens is sometimes they'll come sometime in the summer and we technically are not supposed to start a student in school without them. So it's nice to have them front end. And so if you don't have a copy of that, which is common, I don't know that I ever had a copy of my kids, um, you can always ask your school and they'll have a copy of it for you and they can um, print that up and, and then you can just PDF it to us. You know, a lot of it's, our registrar does a lot of that where you can, um, you know, use a, a PDF scan. If you don't know, you may have one on your phone actually, um, where you can just scan it and send it to our registrar. Uh, and that could be anything, the last report card or anything like that that we might need. Um, it's pretty easy to get to us once we have you in our system. And really that's the key. Once you're in our system, our registrar is alerted to you and then all of a sudden things happen, so. All right. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for spending an hour of your evening with us. We really do want your incoming freshmen to have a really good start to their high school experience, especially considering we are coming off of such an unusual and difficult year. And so if you do have questions, please reach out to your child's counselor or administrator, we are happy to help and we want to answer your questions so that you feel prepared to send your student to Chico High because we are looking forward to having them here on campus. Um, with that being said, I am you are free to go. I am going to leave the chat open for another few minutes. So if you do have a question that you did not have time to ask, you can drop it in the chat. But if your questions have been answered, then um, please have a wonderful evening and enjoy this beautiful weather that we're happening that we're having right now. Thank you so much.